Um, I see people are starting to flood in. Um, that's great. We tried for a couple weeks on Slack and have heard your feedback that um, Zoom is better and we also agree and um, this way we're also able to bring in special guests um, to talk through some of the things that we um, discuss in the Responsive Weekly. Um, so this week I'm McKenna and Noah is also here and we're waiting on someone else to join but um, we figured we'd start the discussion anyway right now about email versus direct mail. Um, there's a constant debate about which one is more valuable, which one should you be using more. Um, and we think at Virtuous, obviously, like the responsive fundraising philosophy starts with like comprehensive understanding of your donor, right? So that means that there is no sort of this or that conversation. It's both and, and how can you use them both strategically? Oh, here he is. Welcome, Brady. Hey, Brady. Hi. <laughs> so you joined at the right time. I was just sort of setting the stage. Um, and we included um, on Tuesday's the Responsive Weekly newsletter, we, were, um, we included your advanced guide to integrated fundraising. So that's why we wanted you here, because you're an expert on this. And um, Noah let me know that you had a lot of thoughts. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the lines in that um, post that I really liked was email fundraising isn't just about online fundraising. Um, and that's sort of how we think about email and direct mail. They're sort of in their own channels. But what you were saying and what we also believe is all the parts add up to a synergy and add up to better fundraising in general. So I was wondering if you could talk about that, talk about um, how you got to that point and what you think about it. Yeah, I think in the, the email that, that y'all sent out, I think Noah made the point, or maybe you McKenna made the point that, you know, donors don't exist in a single channel world. You know, we as marketers all the time do this analysis and we look at channels and, you know, we as humans don't operate that way of thinking, oh, they sent me this email or they sent me this mail piece. Like we, we can't even process that information. We don't even know uh, what's going on. And for us, that's why testing and data is so critical because if you ask donors, do you want to get mail or do you want to get email or, do you receive both? They, they don't even necessarily know all the time. And so uh, where we've seen the value of email and offline is we look at cohorts, right? So you've got an online only cohort, an offline only cohort, an offline only who receives email, and then a multi-channel, so people who give online and offline. That's an analysis that we do with all of our clients. And what we've seen is that people who only write checks just by getting emails give 90% more, just by getting emails whether or not they click, whether or not they do anything, just by getting emails. So we know that the, the channels play a role with one another, even though you'll never see that show up in your online revenue you know, bucket. So that's why I think data is really important because if people just said, you know, we only receive 10% of our fundraising from you know, online and a smaller portion of that from email, so why would we spend all this time focusing on email? Well, it's because we don't have the full picture of actually where information or where data and donors are coming from. So if we expand the data universe, then we get a much clearer picture and then it shapes strategy, right? That's what's really, really key to this conversation. Yeah, that's an amazing um, statistic. And I also think it speaks to um, sort of the different ways that you have to interact with people, right? When we talk about responsive fundraising, we talk about leading with saying thank you more often than you ask for people. And that's a great way that email can, can work for you even with offline givers, right? is you have to keep those touches going throughout the year so that people feel like you're actually engaging with them and creating this relationship rather than just sending the ask. And that's when the two sort of um, email and direct mail work together in that way and obviously help operators because email is the sort of like easier thing to put together, but um, they're both impactful in that way. Yeah, yeah and I think and that's what, <clears throat> oh, good. Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I know you mentioned the 90% more. I think the first question that came to my mind was like, well, what are you emailing them about? Like, how are they related to mail? So I think even getting more practical into that, like how does mail and email work even from a messaging content standpoint? And what recommendations have you seen work well? Uh, knowing that that's for your clients, but people should test it. But what, what does work well? Yeah. So what's interesting is that um, at one level, it, like, it doesn't even matter <laughs> what the content is. <laughs> It's, it's about this concept of like priming or being present or being top of mind or being top of inbox or whatever it is. So, you know, that's the first thing that we look for in our analysis is just like, what is the volume? And volume is not the answer. 
but it is a critical thing. Like if you are just not emailing or not mailing enough, and for a lot of organizations on email, that's what we find is like, if all you do is just send one more email a month, you should see an increase. Even if that's a crappy email, there's something about, you know, just the value of touch point communication. Now, obviously, once you get into the specifics, it's, it's a lot more important. So what we've learned, at least in the first early days of multi-channel, it was kind of like you say the exact same thing. What you say in the mail, you also say exactly in email. And there's a the benefit of that in terms of, you know, message repetition and being consistent. Well, what we've learned is that you can use messages that work together that maybe work better within the channel. So if you're asking for, you know, uh, you're fundraising for a clean water project, you don't change the ask from direct mail from email. And you probably have one email that still is the story of direct mail, but it's a flawed assumption thinking that everyone receives the mail and everyone reads the mail and everyone understands and remembers the story so that there's this like perfect synergy with what you have in email. So, you know, the, the kind of classic, you know, replicate and do a follow-up is like the absolute bare minimum. What we've learned more is um, before that direct mail piece even hits, there's key messages that you should be talking about, like thanking donors, um, following up on the impact of maybe their last gift or the work to date. And you know that you have an ask in the mail that will hit their inbox soon. And so you are using this psychological principle called priming, where people will remember a stimulus and kind of recall it later on. And what we found is you have about two or three weeks to do this. If you do it too soon, people will kind of forget it. If you do it too late, there's not enough time to actually build up this, this kind of stimulus or this memory that you can then access with another piece. So things like gratitude, fulfillment, recognition, reward, you, you kind of make them feel good about maybe past actions or build up the trust. So then when you get into your campaign with the direct mail ask and the email ask, um, they, again, they'll never tell you that that played a role, but we know that that actually does play a role. So that's been one of the biggest kind of discoveries I think that we've had is you don't just say the same thing and you can actually kind of precede uh, the campaign and especially the mail with something uh, in advance. Yeah. And for those that just joined us, um, Brady is from Next After. Um, and we're talking about the, the synergy between mail and email. And is it mail or email? Is it mail and email? What does that actually mean and what does that look like? And Brady's wrote a great article that kind of unpacks some of the research Next After has done. I've shared that in the chat pane, but one of the things we want to make sure that we have for these discussions is that it is a discussion. We want to open this up for dialogue and questions from the audience. Normally there's like a webinar that has 45 minutes of content and then 50 minutes of Q&A. We're starting just 30 minutes of Q&A. So we're priming the pump, talking through this, but Brady joined us. So feel free to ask any questions for Brady. Um, I know I spent seven years doing fundraising for a larger nonprofit, and we saw this concept of priming work every single time, even eight years ago, where we would send emails and then prime back uh, or prime direct mail pieces that we were going to send. Uh, and like you mentioned, it almost doesn't matter what you said. It, <laughs> what you said can improve that, but just by actually delivering something, then them receiving the mail is a great way to do this. We also did this with other channels where we would have our, our mid-level donor team actually call and thank donors for their involvement in their partnership a week or two ahead of them receiving that direct mail piece in uh, the direct mail. And I think the key here is something you said that was slight, a slight undertone, but I think it's so important, is that it's not about the channel. And because even if you mail, some people might still give online. If you email, they might give offline. It's about the donor and how do you connect them, that supporter to that story. So are there other best practices that you've seen or anything else that I think is top of mind before we dive into some of the questions that are coming in? No, I just, I think it, it, it goes back to the importance of capturing and acquiring emails. Again, if, if you can start making the linkage between um, financial value, not directly tied to online, but even just people who receive email, and this would apply to people who buy tickets, who buy t-shirts, you know, other ways that you generate revenue by having that email, and then what we've seen is, you know, that multi-channel bucket where people are even more valuable, like extremely more valuable than online or offline only. Um, converting people into that, you have a much better chance going from online to offline because when people give online, they give you all their information, right? So you have a mailing address, you have an email, sometimes you even have a phone number. Whereas if someone gives through the mail, you often don't have their email. So how do you kind of start connecting to them online? So when we go, how do you grow the most valuable donors? We think that acquiring emails of donors online, which is cheaper and faster and um, better data is a much, much better route to go. So even if you're trying to just grow offline revenue, we still think the route forward is, 
growing and acquiring your email file to grow on uh, your online giving, which will then lead to direct mail. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but when you actually step back and maybe think of the pieces, it makes a lot of sense is that focusing on email is actually one of the best ways to grow your direct mail file or your offline giving as well. Yeah, that's so interesting because I do think the debate has always been like, oh, direct mail's dead or a direct mail program isn't performing. So we need to do email program. And we still think about it in channel. So even as you all work with clients, it's almost like there's silos too, because it's like, oh, this person's responsible for the direct mail program and this person's responsible for the digital yeah. program. How do you break down silos? How do you begin to do, besides saying like, stop doing that, like what are some <laughs> other practical advice that you have for uh, the nonprofits that are trying to do this well? Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest, you know, hurdle in this whole thing, especially once you get into larger organizations who then have, you know, agencies, you got a direct mail agency and a digital agency and different departments and fundraising or digital is often, you know, often under marketing or communications and fundraising direct mail. So you get all these kind of issues. I think, you know, not to be overly simplistic, but the, the data is absolutely cr critical. If you can have the shared understanding of like the work that we do in digital helps the work that you do in, you know, offline and vice versa. If we can figure out how to use offline to help the online, uh, we have shared goals here in terms of getting more donors, growing revenue. So let's work more closely together. And, you know, if there's not an understanding that what you do helps me and what I do help you, then trying to foster collaboration is really, really difficult. You're hoping that, you know, you're nice people who want to work together. So I think the more that we can use, you know, data and goals to say, like, you are different teams and departments and have different responsibilities, but this is shared like this, you each contribute to this, then it makes more sense to get those two talking together. Um, I think increasingly, uh, the digital side has a lot of room to improve, like we can text messages before we actually create the direct mail package, for example. You know, like in the past, it's been direct mail or the mail leads the strategy because it has to be done so much earlier. Um, whereas, you know, in digital, you can be so much quicker. So there's, there's this untapped arena of how to maybe use digital even more, you know, for offline that, that would be interesting to see. Absolutely. Courtney had a few great questions. I figured she might need to provide clarity. So I was going to let her actually ask the questions directly. So, hey, Courtney, you're on the response. Weekly, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so the first question I had was, uh, do you feel that it's better to use uh, direct mail secondary after you first send an email communication? So would you first start with the email communication and then a physical piece of mail or can it be flipped? Does it matter the order? Yeah, it's, it's both, I think is, is the answer. Um, again, the, the ask email itself, I haven't seen any information that says it should definitely be before, definitely be after. The thing that we are more definitive on is the communication leading up to when they receive the direct mail appeal is really crucial and that's probably easier to do in email. That's the kind of stuff that, you know, thank you so much for your gift, here's a story from the field. <laughs> Those types of things absolutely have to come before the direct mail piece actually hits their inbox. Um, a lot of organizations will do a straddle. So one ask email before the direct mail and then another ask email afterwards. Um, what, what's interesting too, and this gets a little bit more advanced, is generally speaking, people are more generous when they write a check than when they give online. So there are some schools of thought in the world of direct mail that say you actually don't want to encourage people to give online. You want them to give offline because they're, they're more generous in, in that way. Um, we don't necessarily subscribe to that theory, but again, if you did, then it puts even more emphasis on using email leading up to say the direct mail appeal. So a, a definitely an email or two before they actually get the package. And then whether or not you do one ask or two ask, a little before, a little after, I have no you know, evidence or research to say for sure, do one or the other. Cool, thank you. And then is it okay if I ask uh, one more question? Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. All right, and just to clarify, um, I know that this is coming from the point of view of fundraising, but I'm actually kind of translating it in terms of getting people to call to action um, since we're a membership organization. Uh, so uh, what I was wondering is, do you find it useful if you use both the email and mail that redirects with more details on a landing page um, with call to actions? if it, like if you have an end goal um, and 
to be more specific for mine, it's uh, towards our legislative session. So getting folks involved. Um, yeah. Um, I would have a little bit less, especially on the mail side, right? So we're, we're like a digital first, digital only shop and we get into the mail. So I won't maybe answer the mail, maybe Noah or McKenna can answer more of the, the mail side of things. I know that the multi-channel strategy absolutely applies to membership. The priming type of things absolutely applies to membership. And the general principle of don't put off today what they can actually do. So why send uh, a piece where the goal is to drive action to then a, a learn more page? The, the goal is that they would have already seen a learn more page. They would have known about the, the program or the membership so that when you ask today, you actually drive to an action only page. There's no, you know, learn more kind of business. So okay. again, this is one of the, the flaws or challenges that we've seen in a lot of nonprofit communication is one communication piece tries to do too much, right? It tries to thank, acknowledge, um, cultivate, and then move to an ask all within one piece. And that's just, that's really, really difficult to do. And you generally just get the people that are most engaged already. So instead of splitting that out of saying, how do we like re-engage, make sure they're thanked, inform them, and then you have another piece that calls them to action. I think that's more of what we need to work towards. Yeah, and just to add there, I think too, like we have to remember whether we're asking someone to give or take another action, like we're still dealing with people and trying to activate them. So I think as Brady said, like all of the uh, uh, same like behavioral psychology principles of like, how do we prime? How do we drive action? Like applies regardless of kind of what the, what the action that you're trying to drive them to do uh, really plays in. So Courtney, I really appreciate the time. Is there any other questions you had before we let you go? Uh, no, that is it. Thanks, y'all. Thanks. So Brady, we did have another question that came in. It came from Anonymous, so we're not going to get to make them speak. Um, but it says, you know, my boss is opposed to using email. If one person complains about getting email, we will never be able to email them again. How do I convince my boss that email is a good idea? I mean, if they're that staunchly opposed, it's going to be tricky, but, um, you know, this is part of the reason why we open source a lot of our data with our own clients, um, to try to help any organization or other people make the case to bosses or superiors. So, you know, I'd look at that blog post that, um, Noah shared out where we show that data of just people who get email add to your bottom line full stop. Like there's, there's very little debate about that. Um, and what's so interesting too, once we get into email is so many people think, oh, I, I hate email. My inbox is a nightmare. I get spammed all the time. And it's like, I and you, and we, we should give two craps about what your boss thinks about email or what you think about your own email inbox, because you don't actually know, nor do I, nor does he or she actually know what it's like to truthfully be on the other side. We are, we are such poor judges uh, of our own experience and understanding. And so what happens is we get one person who complains and says, you email me too much. And then boom, the email program toast. You go back down to one email when you've got hundreds or thousands of people who love it. And so it's, it's, this is where, again, data and testing can play such a critical role so that we don't cater what we call edge cases. You know, if you think about a bell curve, you will always have people that read everything, love everything. And then you have people that will hate everything and think everything's too much. And when you do survey, you often get responses on both ends of a bell curve. So you get the people who love you and the people who hate you. And so even like asking for feedback can be really tr tricky sometimes because the bulk are just kind of like kind of engaged, but not so engaged to give you their opinion. And so even like, you know, going off responses of one on either side, you know, major gifts or people who hate you. Uh, both of those things are very, very problematic for developing any sort of marketing or fundraising at scale because most people are in the bulk of the middle there. So uh, many different things, but one, use, use some data, whether it's ours or other people's to say, uh, here's why email is so valuable. Uh, it's one of the most used things of boomers who are the largest giving generation. Um, so, you know, use some of those statistics. Um, so ho hopefully that helps a little bit. <laughs> and then the other thing that we found useful is saying, well, let's just try, you know, let's try this type of email program for three months and, you know, see how it goes. Um, often it's easier to get things done if it's under like a pilot or a test or a trial, as opposed to this is something we are going to do indefinitely. Um, and then hopefully the pilot works and then you can kind of, you know, move it into where you want it to go. So long answer there, but hopefully it's helpful. 
I think it also speaks to um, the importance of donor tagging and donor segmentation because you can start to find those people who are most likely to engage with your emails to sort of then take that um, take the data from next after the sort of general data plus the data you can pull directly from your donor base and sort of present that as like a comprehensive strategy of this is working generally and this is working for us and then build that out from what you get in those initial test runs right so using both sets of data and using those test runs on a specific set of people who have traditionally seemed enthusiastic in the past or sort of have only interacted with your online channels that's a great way to um, build a successful strategy that you can then present to anybody who's sort of opposed to that new email strategy. Um, I did, we did have two notes that came in. Uh, Deb and Lexi both shared positive stories about how they've been able to use email um, and send stories. So I'm gonna see if Lexi wants to share her own story. So Lexi, you can talk now if you're up for it. If not, we can kick you off, no shame in the game. We, <laughs> we're, we're not gonna force you to talk if you don't want to. I think Lexi, you're on whenever you're ready. So I think you should be able to talk now, Lexi. Your mic is unmuted, but it may be just not connected. So that might be the issue. Can you hear me now? Yep, perfect. Okay, good. I did. I logged on differently. So um, yeah, so we're a zoo. So that does help because we have good pictures. And you know, we've always used email and kind of sent out monthly updates and, and such. But when this all hit and we had to close, we started, we really all worked together and created what we called the Monday Minute and started sending out weekly emails and in there you know we've had some controversy within our our organization of you know promoting park events and us in fundraising always wanting that that donor message and it was when all the other stuff went away that it was easier for us to to get our message into all of those emails and we have found now people love those emails and most of it is good stories and pictures but there's the reality in there too we closed we lost two-thirds of our staff um, but we get donations every single time and at the bottom of every email now, you know, and we have a lot of options, become a monthly donor, renew your membership, virtually adopt an animal. But just yesterday we put out a very specific email about it was World Dog Day. So we have African wild dogs and we said virtually adopt and we, I think, got, you know, seven adoptions, you know, for not a huge amount, but overall, you know, we just really see it as um, very effective for us. Yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that story, Lexi. Thanks. Um, I know we're coming up on time. McKenna, did you um, have other questions that you wanted to dive into or other kind of topics from, it looks like we have a few more notes. Yep. One, another anonymous person, so we won't put you on the spot. Um, asked, how do we move to a more direct mail campaign when we're an organization that sends at least two emails a day? Which I think um, is, a, is a great question because we, we do see that direct mail is very effective and um, leaning too heavy on one channel or another um, might be leaving money on the table. So Brady, do you have any thoughts on that? Two emails a day they send? Yes, at I least. That is a, that's a lot of emails. So hopefully there's some good segmentation going on in there. Uh, you know, most of our work is, is going the other way. How do we move people more towards digital as opposed to, to direct mail? Um, I think one of the, the biggest things to consider here, and it, it, it's important in this conversation too, is, is cost. Like there's very little tangible cost to email. There is very tangible real cost to direct mail. And that's often a barrier. And so one of the, the biggest things when you start a direct mail program is knowing um, when to stop mailing people and how to optimize. Uh, I, I'm gonna get the numbers wrong, but uh, the millions of people that get mailed who are dead is staggering, right? And it's, it's just pure data. When we used to do, when I used to do a lot more direct mail when I had my own uh, agency, basically once someone hasn't given about 14 months, the, the percent of their response rate goes down below 1%, less than a half percent normally. So, the kind of front loading or that first year of communication on the direct mail side is really, really key. So, you know, welcome package, maybe the first three, six months, you have a regular cadence 
And then if they aren't giving through the mail or you see that there's not an engagement, you know, overall, then being able to let them go. That's one of the, the things that we need to do more of on the mail side, but it's even more paramount on, uh, on the email side. It's even more paramount on the mail side because it'll cost you revenue. Um, and then focusing on a campaign. I think a campaign focus is really key as well. So instead of thinking about like, what do we do all year? Being able to pick, you know, here's a year end campaign. Here's a spring campaign. It makes it a lot easier to identify here's when we're going to do a direct mail piece or not. Um, so hopefully that helps a little bit. That's kind of a broad, vagueish question, but hopefully it helps. All right, so we had one more person. Deb wanted to share her story, um, which speaks to emailing people and I guess like the personalized experience of your organization and how um, one donor can really change their mind based on how you communicate with them. So thanks for joining us, Deb. Great, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, anyway, I work for a health foundation and this person has been a, a very generous donor for many years and has been very responsive to, to sharing feedback with us. So very engaged in the process. Um, but for years, he would always complain to me about how he hates emails. That's he, he's a, you know, call him, talk to him directly kind of guy. And uh, so I, I knew that, but we would send out this math. Yesterday, he responded after getting one of our e-newsletters. He took the time to respond and say, I know I've been anti-email in the past, but I was very pleased to receive this and love the information. And so I look forward to next month's issue. And so that was just mm -hmm. like great feedback. Again, you eventually people realize there are different ways to receive information. And we were very grateful he took the time to let us know that he is accepting of emails now as well. Well, it's, it's interesting. It's a great story. Thanks for sharing, Deb. It's, it's interesting when you hear people say like, I don't, I, I don't like email uh, or I don't use email. Often what we're saying is I don't like the types of emails that I get. It's not really email that's the problem. It's like the content within the email, right? And um, in a research study, we're doing this with, with uh, Virtuous right now, looking at multi-channel online and offline. And I was just talking with one of our data analysts going back and forth about um, how many emails the goal isn't to ask, but there's big donate buttons, there's passive ask to donate. So as a donor, you feel like you, you are being asked all the time. So people go, oh, they ask me all the time. Whereas we on the communication side, no, that wasn't an appeal. We were just telling you a story. But when the donor opens an email and sees a big donate button, they feel like they're being asked. And so, you know, being able to truly listen to donors and people when they say, I don't like email, or I get too much email to, to to have more discerning voice, be like, what are they really saying? Is it the content? Is it the frequency? You know, those types of things. Because this is a great example where that person opened, read, read the email, loves the email. So they don't actually hate email. They didn't like something about what was going on. So that's great. 